Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabil Ummi. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shirah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul ukratan min lisani afkahu kawli. Thank you, uh, uh, Brother Siraj, the chairman, uh, my respected uh, sheikh, and brothers and sisters. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh. I will, I won't take much time because I actually I also want to listen to the sheikh. <laughs> it is a run. But I will uh, give uh, a brief uh, uh, a run with this economic view of the whole thing, and our Shay will talk from Islamic uh, perspective, okay? All right. See, the, the title given to us today is Will the World Economy Take Its Greatest Plunge in This Year, right? My answer is Wallah uh, Allah knows best what will happen next year. But there's always a cost-effect relationship between things, right? So the sabab wa musabab. So I'll take you through from an economic perspective what I perceive will be in, in next year, right? All right. Huh? So you see this uh, debt problem in the U.S. I mean uh, throughout the world. The largest. These are all in uh, euros. Huh? See the U.S. debt is 10 billion euros. Huh? And you see Japan is 9 billion euros. Germany, which is in uh, um, uh, Euro, 2 billion euros. And you see the debt until all of them. You look at US, Japan, and Germany. These are the most in industrialized nations in the world right now. America, Japan, and Germany in uh, Euro. Now, why, why the highly industrialized nations are facing such a debt problem? That is the question. You see, if you notice in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where people are able to produce a lot, like, huh, like these people, if you produce a lot, you are intelligent, you should be the creditor in the, in the system, not the debtor. Right? So why are you the debtor in the nation, the largest? It's because of the way the monetary uh, system is structured. What is the problem with the monetary uh, system is that we, today we have uh, basically a uh, it's not working. Basically, we have a, a debt, what do you call that, fiat monetary system, interest-based fiat monetary system. That means you all know huh? it's paper currency, which is simply created out of nothing, right? All those things. Huh? So you see, the, the one I showed you is actually, uh, it is the government debt. But what matters in macroeconomics is actually the, the entire debt, the government debt plus the individual debt plus the business debt. We need to see what is the total debt of the system, right? So when you see the total debt, if you see like for countries, those in red color, you see Japan is red, eh? Britain is red, and France and most of the countries in uh, uh, Europe, you see they are dark orange, isn't it? These countries have received over, over 400 of the GDP. GDP is what the country can uh, produce totally uh, in the one whole year. What is in total they can produce? So you have these countries 400 times, that means four times. The debt is four times the what the country can produce. Look at Japan. Eh? Japan is the highest in the world, the total debt. So the total debt of Japan is four times it can produce as a whole nation. You see that? And you know that debt is, uh, debt is it carries compounded interest. Eh? So when debt carries compounded interest, it is an exponential function. So therefore, the number grows exponentially day by day. Huh? So what happens when you have a system like this? The, the real economy, the, the, the economy that produces real things, it cannot match the, the, the rise of the debt. Yeah, yeah, you follow? Huh? So the, the, the monetary system will not be able, it will be, the, the real sector will not be able to catch up with the, the, the monetary sector. Huh? That is the whole, what is happening uh, in the global economy right now. All right. Now you see, um, you see the. This is the gold price. Eh? This is the gold price from the day we started talking about it. Uh, upon, uh, upon Nick Mahan is behind. Uh, she was with us from the time we were doing this. So you see, when we started to talk about the gold price at that time, it was only about 160 something per ounce. Eh? Now you know it is almost. Uh, 1,700 plus already, right? So you see the, the gold price, it has gone to, the, do you see the exponential growth? 
Now, the, the important thing is this. A lot of studies have shown that the goal, when you price relative to real things, the thing that you produce, eh, it is a constant. It's a constant. So if you see an exponential growth like this, what is it telling you? It is basically telling us that the dollar and the global economy is collapsing exponentially. That is the story goal is telling us, okay? The, the dollar and the global uh, economy is collapsing exponentially. It is not the, it is not the price of the goal is telling, eh? it's telling the story of the, the dollar, okay? All right, so uh, you know, you notice, look at this, eh? So therefore, when, when economies, when, when an economy is unable to pay the debt, you see 400% Japan, right? It's stuck. America, stuck. Japan, uh, Europe also stuck, right? We call that in economics liquidity trap. Right? The markets are all in liquidity trap. <clears throat> so when you have a liquidity trap, the way to solve this is through uh, a debt relief. You have to write off the debt. Uh, you know, you have to do puskan all the hutang, huh? You have to write off the debt, at least the, 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 in the interest portion. Uh, the interest portion you got to write off. And you require people to pay only the principal portion. Now that is necessary if you want to jumpstart the economy again. Uh, I'll come back to that. So when you don't do that, when people, uh, when, when, when people and businesses default, then there'll be a collapse of the monetary system. That's what we call the meltdown. A destruction of money takes place currently. Huh? So you see uh, the America, uh, and then you see uh, uh, Europe, and you also see uh, Dubai, right? The, the Arab Spring also has had relation to that. And I think by next year and so on, we will be facing it. Huh? There is a domino effect that is taking place. So the Arab Spring is also because of a collapse of the monetary system. So it all started in 2007 when the subprime crisis started. You all are aware of that, right? So it's actually a destruction of uh, the dollar. So the destruction of dollars spread the problem to the Europe. So you saw many banks in Europe also were collapsing, right? So now uh, this, uh, you know, the Arab world, the Dubai and so on, huh? it's what is, that's what is happening. So uh, what we are observing today is basically the collapse of the debt-based monetary system globally. Huh? The debt-based monetary system is what is collapsing uh, uh, globally. So if I can, uh, you know, that means, you see the major currencies that I showed you just now, the dollar, the, 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 the yen, and the euro, all of them will face problem now. Because these are the major countries with the major debt, isn't it? So when these countries uh, collapse, so all these currencies will collapse. So this is what we are going to face. So when, when the major currencies collapse, then the question is, what will be the, this thing? People will lose confidence in all currencies. Because these are the major uh, you know, currencies, people put so much of faith in them, right? So when these currencies face problem and collapse, so people will just, you know, will lose faith in all currencies. So now the alternative is, what, what will be the alternative will uh, come into question. Eh? Now you see, in, uh, in, uh, in when things collapse like this, eh? you see in a fiat monetary system, you all know what is the Sinoraj, right? The synergy is, you see, now, money that is created out of nothing, when you print or when you create money through electronically, it is very easy, very cheap to create. So the extra, the free purchasing power that it carries with it, eh, we call the synergy. Eh? The synergy will transfer wealth and power from individuals, companies, governments to people who create money. So this is a view from, uh, uh, this is the view from a political, uh, a political economic perspective. Uh, you know that the domains of political economy is the struggle for wealth and power, right? So this monetary system will take away the wealth and power from uh, individuals, businesses, and governments, and it will enthrone this to on people uh, who create money, those who are given uh, the right to create money. Basically, the, today's the banking system. Uh, huh? Well, the banking system, they will be the ones who become the creators. So you see, you, see, you saw the, the statistics earlier. You saw America, uh, uh, Japan and all this, you saw that they are becoming debtors, isn't it? But in accounting, you know that for every debtor, there must be a creditor. So who are the creditors in the system? Uh, those are the ones. So to whom you gave the, the right to create money out of nothing and give to people as a loan on a compounded basis. So they are the creditors in the system. Okay? So the whole world, individuals, businesses and governments will become indebted. You all will become indebted. 
the creditors will be the, the banking system. And, and slowly you will find the control over the resources of the nation and also the power will be enthroned on this group. Very easy. It's, it's not, I don't think you need a PhD to uh, understand this, right? A very simple logic, isn't it? Now you notice uh, what happened in the, uh, the Greek, uh, in the Europe, European uh, debt problem. Eh? You see in the European debt problem, after the entire thing collapsing, you notice that they replaced one uh, uh, new Italian Greece got new prime minister, right? So you notice uh, the new uh, prime minister, it's not uh, elected, but you see uh, he's a member of former Goldman Sachs international uh, advisors. Look at Greece, also appointed. Who is this thing? He was the former governor of the bank. So you will find that this is what will happen. Ultimately, you will see that the people will be uh, placed at the, uh, at the... So our politicians all will have to give away last really, you know? So uh, the, the, other, uh, the other politicians will come. And then they will put an austerity plan on you. You have to, you know, you have to work and work and work. You become slaves and they'll put high taxations and you'll become austerity plan and so on. Basically, you'll, you'll do a life of slaves. That's what will happen in, the, in, the, in the, this monetary system. Go ahead on the next one. So you see, to, the, to solve the, the European problem, you see German uh, Chancellor Angela is calling for fiscal union. You see, the euro is a monetary union. Then you see, with the monetary union alone, you cannot go on. You see, a lot of problems, isn't it? It's also because of the Sinoraj. The Sinoraj. So you need a fiscal union. That means the governments, eh, when they want to do the budgeting, they got to be uh, united. That's, uh, that's what I mean by fiscal union. So when you have a fiscal union like that and a monetary union, basically you become a one country, one nation. You see that? So the local politicians will lose power after that. You'll become, uh, you just follow whatever orders being given to you. Yeah, get it, huh? So this is what you say is going for fiscal union, and I say this is the path to the one world government. You notice in the Arab world, what is happening? It is one by one the, our the leaders collapse is creating a vacuum in leadership, isn't it? Right? So it creates vacuum in leadership, and here you will see that. Uh, the formation of a, a kind of one world government. So, the, so you need to see the monetary system with uh, political, global politics, then you see what is, uh, what is happening, okay? So if you ask me what needs to be done for uh, this thing, I've got a number of things that I put the, rate, the most important ones. The first thing is you got to give uh, the system a red uh, write-off, at least the interest portion. That's what, that's what the Quran says in the, uh, uh, the Quran says. For that, the, you need to write off all the riba and the interest portions. You are entitled to your principal, right? But unfortunately, in the, in the today's system, the principal is also created out of nothing. Right now. So that's the reason why I put number one, you nationalize the banks. So you nationalize banks like China, uh, India, and many other countries like Brazil and so on. So when you pay back the principal, you pay back to uh, the nationalized bank. So that means the bank that belongs to the government, because the government represents the people. But today's banks are all private. We have given them the right to create money, huh? and then they're just privately creating the money and giving it to you as loan on a compounded basis. You see? The next is, of course, we have to eliminate riba after that. Huh? It is the entire cost of the whole thing is actually riba. You know, you can trace riba to almost everything, the crime levels, the, the climate change, you know the the fall in uh, you know more the moral of the people, you can you can trace it back to the uh, to uh, riba. You see, so you need to eliminate riba and institute real money system. So real money systems are systems that take real things as money. So that's why we are saying go back to gold, silver, and anything that's real. The 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 hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you remember, gold for gold, silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, salt for salt. Right. They've, so all these are commodities that can play the role of money as a measure of value. This is what is missing in the global monetary system. Uh, measure of value. We have kilograms to measure our, made, uh, our weight, right? We have length meters to measure our length, isn't it? Or distance. But in international trade, we exchange values. In trade business, we exchange values, right? But we do not have a measure of value in present system since 1971 when the Bretton Woods collapsed. So this is the missing thing, the measure of value. So you can only measure value with real things, things that have the characteristics of money. 
So that is the reason why we have to go back to gold, silver, and real things and as a measure of value. Huh? And because the present system has created so much of imbalance, because if see, if you give me the right, let's say this economy, if you give me the right to create money, I can just create money, create money, and give you guys a loan at a compounded basis. Soon you'll find most of your wealth will accumulate with me. So if you want to solve the problem, I have to take, you, you have to take back some of this wealth and give it back to you. Otherwise, you will not be able to start back your the economic this thing again you notice that so when the system come accumulates so much of wealth with me i have got to give it back so that's why redistribution of wealth is necessary you see the subprime crisis when it took place more than five million homes were foreclosed five million you know so if i'm a bank manager i just have to go and choose which one i like <laughs> right now right now so the solution they are currently uh, 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 suggesting is euro bonds you know what are euro bonds? It's more debt. The problem is debt, and then you create more debt. How to solve problem with uh, a debt with another debt, is it? You see, you need to understand uh, problem solving in micro and macro. For example, let's say we are all economy. If I print $1 million and give it to one of you, you will immediately you'll become a millionaire, right? <coughs> Correct or not? But if I create millions and give to each one of you, then it will be only inflation. You will not become rich. So you can solve one section of the economy, but you cannot solve the entire thing with a similar, uh, similar solution. So same as debt. If you have a debt problem individually, you can solve one person's problem like that, but you cannot solve the, solve the system like that. You see that? So you cannot create euro bonds to solve the problem. It will only worsen the problem. You are creating more money. You are creating more money to solve this thing. Uh, and since the real things will be same, right? The same real things, it will create hyperinflation. The system will create hyperinflation. That's why, uh, can, can, can you go back? You see, that's why the problem will create a hyperinflation. So next year, you are going to find price of a lot of things going to just skyrocket. You see, not only the Europeans are uh, you know, uh, thinking of Euro bonds, the Americans are now talking about quantitative easing number three, QE3. You know what is QE3? It is just printing more money. It sounds very sophisticated, isn't it? Quantitative easing. It sounds like quantum physics, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but it's basically, it's just like uh, printing, uh, <laughs> it's printing more money. So all this will create global hyperinflation. So what is worrying is this, you know, your price of your rice, price of your wheat, the staple food will skyrocket next year. The bread, uh, bread and everything, when they take this kind of solution. See? Uh, so countries that uh, import food will be devastated. You see that? Mm. And 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 it will create the it will bring the whole world economy into a serious recession when you go on in this uh, on this path like that. All they want to do is they just want to try to save the euro at all costs because they know it's uh, unsustainable. So they're trying to create more money, more money, and then try. when you create more money like this, it will just still again accumulate with the same small group of people. It's not going to be distributed widely with the entire system. It's going to accumulate, accumulate with a small group. So it's going to create a serious unemployment and also a global economic depression, if you see from the way I see the, the direction it's going. And if you learn anything from our past history, uh, mankind, whenever such things happen, they always try to solve the problem through wars. Through wars, eh? So when you cannot control people through economic, this thing like this, the synergy of the international currencies, which are losing, all of them, euro, 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 the dollar, yen, all are going down. So what do you do? You go and take the people's real resources, take over the real resources. So that is the reason why you see, you see the game in the Middle East. It is actually, it's a war for oil. It's a control for oil. Because if you control the oil resources, you can control China, you can control everyone. Because they all need the oil for the economic engine. You see that? Even Alan Greenspan in his book, the, you know, the, the Age of Turbulence, he mentioned the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi war is for oil, you know. It's in, in the book. Right? You can say it is for, you know, the, all the, you know, the mass destruction and all the stuff. But it's for oil. Huh? So if you see the game, there's only one country left for them, uh, for them to take on. The moment if they get Iran, then 
uh, the China will be subdued. So the whole game, it is not, it is not all this uh, Islamic terrorists uh, and so on. It's basically to check the rise of China, basically China and, and Russia and so on. So that is the reason, if you notice recently, the, the, the general in China, right, he gave a warning. If you touch uh, Iran, then it's a war. Huh? It's going to be World War Three. Why are they saying that? You see? Yeah, Chinese generally say, if you touch Iran, it's going to be World War Three. So that's why it's very difficult for them to even take on uh, Syria, huh? because Syria, uh, you like, uh, like Libya, because uh, the moment they go for Syria, it means Iran might go, you see? So Iran goes means it's going to be a... So it's very, uh, very, uh, in a situation that you can create a serious world war, the way you see it. So if you see the entire the scenario, now because the solution is not taken, because they didn't give the debt relief, and they have opted to create more debt and more fiat money to solve the global crisis, I think it's go we are going to face a serious plunge next year. You know, it is all very close. With only uh, in the in the political game, it's only Iran that is left. So just to give you uh, an effect of all this on gold, you notice the the exponential growth of gold price, isn't it? So uh, to give you an effect on gold, you see the there is the gold is the real money. Mankind learn gold is the real money. That is the reason why, even though the Federal Reserve that prints the dollar. And they don't back the dollar with gold. You cannot go to the Federal Reserve with your dollar and ask for gold. Huh? They won't. It's not redeemable. And yet, they are the largest holder of gold in the world, isn't it? Right in front of Fort Knox. So why is it? Because they know it is the real money. So uh, we have done. There's a correlation between the dollar and uh, gold. It's almost for negative one for one. If the dollar were to go up, the gold price would go down. Go dollar to collapse, gold price would go up. Almost one for one. So since you saw the gold price is going up, it's because the dollar is collapsing. Huh? It's negative. So now that will be linked to the, the euro and also the yen. All of them are in a similar problem. Liquidity trap. Remember the word liquidity trap. And, and, and I say that there's going to be a hyperinflation, isn't it? So and gold is a proven hedge against inflation. Anytime inflation goes up, the price of gold also will go up. So you can protect your savings by uh, diversifying some of your this thing into gold and silver. Hmm? So again, there'll be a fact. It'll be uh, you saw the the documentary just now, isn't it? Huh? They is expected to go up very high. And 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 then you see the central banks. They also know the problem of the fiat money. Yeah. So they are also diversifying into gold. So most of the central banks are also buying a lot of gold now, stockpiling gold. Gold is the only commodity held by central banks as a reserve asset. You know that, eh? I, I always joke, they don't hold coffee or tea eh? as a reserve asset, only, eh? only gold. And then uh, India, also one of the countries that is uh, fast growing, and you know that India is one of the largest consumer of gold also. Not only the central bank is stockpiling gold, so the Indian people also buying a lot of gold. If you watch a uh, Hindi movie, you can see it. Uh, huh? <laughs> and then, uh, and, and, and also, if we, if we accept the age of turbulence, if you think that the next year is going to be an age of turbulence, then uh, the gold is also an asset of choice during times of chaotic times. Because you see, uh, with gold, you can take your gold and you can just move away to a place where uh, it's safer or where there's more peace. Right? So that's the reason anytime, whenever there's a war, the price of gold will go up. So if you are expecting next year to be a chaotic year, then again gold price will also go up. In fact, Alan Greenspan, eh, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, when he left the Federal Reserve in 2005 or 2005 or 2006, right? When he left, immediately he wrote a book. You know the title of the book? It's called The Age of Turbulence. See, he knew what, he knew what was coming. Eh? Now, uh, next, you see, it is also a proven store of value. Huh? Proven store, uh, store of value. So the moment you convert your this thing, you see your, the paper money that you have, the savings you have, every day its value goes down. Each time the banking system gives out a loan to someone, the value of your savings will go down because of inflation. But gold can protect it. That's why in Malaysia, if you have a 10 cents coin, it will be returned in 1970 or something, right? I always like to say this, because I was a small boy during that time. 
The 10 cents can buy you uh, roti chanai. I used to get to go to school 10 cents. Uh, there's, a, there's a money I get for uh, to go to school. 10 cents. Uh, you can buy things. Today, if you bring the 10 cents to the uh, to a restaurant, uh, what, what can you get? Uh, <laughs> even a glass of water, they charge 20 cents now, right? You get nothing. But if you take a goal, you see the goal, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, can buy you a sheep. It's documented in Sahih Bukhari and so on, isn't it? That is, a, that is a very well known in Ilah. So we can give that example. So today also you can buy your sheep. Because the dinar is now by 800 something. 800 something dollars you can buy a gold, right? Isn't it? So you see for 1500 years it can maintain its purchasing power. That's what we mean by it's a proven store of value. Our other currencies within 30 years the value is gone. The dollar lost its value in the last 40 years, 90% of its value. The dollar. From 1971 to this one now, 90% huh? of the value is gone. <laughs> See? And that's the reason why we all, a lot of people are talking about returning back to the gold standard, gold dinar, and so on. Even not only us, even the, the Western. You know, the Robert, uh, you know, the, the uh, Nobel laureate said this, year is, uh, this century is going to be here, uh, the gold is going to return. Even the president of World Bank said, let's go back to gold. So when everyone is talking, uh, let's go back to gold. So again, the value of gold will go, huh? go up. So you can see, when I mention gold, huh, it's also related to silver. Okay. So this, these two metals, they always play the role of money together. Yeah? So you will notice that this will be the effect on uh, uh, the metals. So what about individuals? What can we do? The governments, I don't think they, they'll be able to take the actions that I mentioned to you. They're not going to come, some politician, okay, we are going to write off all your debt, you know. It's not going to happen. Even though in history it happened, eh? historically it has happened periodically, they'll do that. But in the modern world, I don't think it is possible. So what, what you can do uh, individually is that you have, you'll have to, I think, put part of our savings, other than that we do for transactions, your savings, protect your savings by investing in precious metals. Or you can go to agri land, because this will, will become very precious very soon. Huh? You cannot invest in houses, huh? the price of house all will come down. All financial markets will come down, all right? except uh, commodity markets will rise and land also. And protect also with complementary currencies. Complementary currencies are systems, monetary systems that will coexist with the, the, the national system electronically or so uh, uh, and by other means. And then you can use that to protect yourself. The moment you have a complementary system working parallel, you can, you can protect. And in fact, in my opinion, the compl complementary currency systems are very important. You can go and Google it. There are many uh, websites that will give you a lot of uh, examples of complementary currencies. But we say the complementary currencies that we do should be based on gold as the measure of value. You remember what is missing in the present system? It is the measure of value. When I was going through this, uh, studying this, I did not understand when, yeah, when, when we saw Imam Al-Ghazali mentioned that Allah SWT created gold and silver as the measure of value. You use that to measure. And when I first uh, read this, I was hoping why the Imam didn't say, you know, that Allah SWT created as a medium of exchange. To use it as money, no, is to play the role of as a measure of value. In fact, you'll come to understand that is what is missing. So that's why the success of uh, when we are, when we all talk about the dinar system, the success of the dinar is not minting the dinar. It's not in minting the dinar or this thing. Yes, it is important, but the success in using pricing things in gold and silver. You can mint the dinar, but the moment you don't price things gold and silver, it will not work. It will not work, okay? Yeah. So therefore, what we are, this thing is that, you know, in 1990s we saw a collapse of socialism, 2007, and now we are actually observing the collapse of uh, capitalism. So there's no more ism for them ready. <laughs> right? So there's only one left. So inshallah, this century is, I think, uh, inshallah, it will be a century for Islam to, to lead. But anytime, you know, paradigms shift, the shift will be very volatile. So that's why whatever I say, it may assume, uh, it may look like uh, well, you are tired, like the prophets of doom. You know, you know remember proper prophets of doom, all uh, the stories of this thing? No. I think that this tenure, this one, one decade will be very volatile. But what we are going to see is an age of bliss, inshallah. It's coming, okay? So if you have the, I put, you know, if you do the right thing, 
we will do something good for our next generation. The next generation, if you let the one world government to go, take a step, they will become one central bank for the, to, to create money for the entire world. That is the direction that they, the other side would like to go. Huh? One central bank for the entire world, one world government. If you go to, uh, if you, if that is rich, huh, what you'll find is that the children will become basically slaves. But it'll be, there'll be peace. There'll be peace because it will be a police state. Right? There will be peace, but basically you will be basically you will be slaves, but you do not know you are slave. You'll be just having your you know a simple uh, little bit of income, but everything else will be controlled, and there'll be a, a godless society basically. But if you reverse it, the other side, if you're able to establish the real money and uh, and eliminate riba and so on, you will release them into an age of uh, bliss, abundance and freedom and age of prosperity uh, and, uh, and a, world, uh, a, a world of faith. This is what you see. So the path right now, you are in a very interesting position in history. Which position, which side you are going to move the, the world? This side or this side? So with that, I stop here because I would like to listen to the Shay more. Huh? I'm sure you are all here to listen to the Shay also, right? So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' Brother Chairman my dear student Shirazuddin Adam Shah Professor Mira, brothers and sisters in Islam here at the International Islamic University in Gombak in Kuala Lumpur. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A jigsaw puzzle is something that uh, you, you were children once upon a time, weren't you? <laughs> and you did play with jigsaw puzzles. A jigsaw puzzle is something in which you have lots of bits and pieces, each one with a little picture or part of a picture. And you have to use some measure of insight to put the pieces together by studying each individual piece and if you succeed in putting all the pieces together then you will see the whole picture only excuse me my opinion and you are free to differ with me. Is it only Islamic eschatology today can put the pieces together and give us the big picture which explains events which have been mysteriously unfolding in the world and which are accelerating at this particular time. Which can explain the coming economic crash, financial crash, monetary crash, concerning which Dr. Mira has done such a splendid job this morning. I'm jealous of him. I don't know how he can do it and yet do it so simply and press all the buttons so beautifully to explain to you the crash that is coming and why it is coming. You know me that for 15 years or more I have been saying <laughs> that the US dollar is going to collapse. I've been saying more than that. That the US dollar must collapse. 
Anna was not doing that because of economic or monetary analysis. I was doing that on the basis of my studies in eschatology. Eschatology, ilmu akhiru zaman is so easy, but this big word is so difficult. Ilmu akhiru zaman, the study of the end time, the study of the end of history. How did I know that the US dollar must collapse? And with it, that the US dollar, the US economy would crash. In 2004, in a lecture in Trinidad on Dajjal, which is all over YouTube, I used the words flying high. You're flying high now, but tomorrow the crash is coming. That was seven years ago. And that when the crash comes, it's going to bring down the entire monetary system. It's going to bring down all the paper money in the world. This, you know, the stuff that we have in our pockets, the bogus, fraudulent, utterly haram paper money. How did I know this? It's because of the study of the Quran and the study of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, his ahadith. A number of things are coming together at this particular time. One of them is the financial crash in which the crash of the US dollar takes pride of place. As Dr. Mira just said, Allahu Alam, Allah knows best and when we give an opinion and we are entitled to give an opinion, we can be right, we can be wrong. The US dollar is now in a place called ICU, in a hospital, <laughs> intensive care unit. It has actually expired and is being kept alive artificially by this pump that they use. You see the chest going up and down. But the plug is soon going to be pulled and then it will be pronounced dead. And uh, the U.S. government knows that very well. That if Israel attacks Iran, that's it. The link between oil and the dollar, as Dr. Mira just explained, if the price of oil shoots up, the implication is that the U.S. dollar is heading down. And they know that an attack on Iran is going to be the final nail in the coffin for the U.S. dollar. That's why the US, United States does not want Iran to be attacked, my opinion. But Israel wants to attack Iran among the reasons is to bring about the collapse of the U.S. dollar. If the U.S. dollar collapses, then automatically the US economy will crash. Remember, this is the international currency. In the same way that its predecessor, the sterling palm, when we were children at school, was the international currency. Today, the US dollar is the international currency. There is going to be such massive financial loss in the United States in particular. White America losing most of its wealth and black America doesn't have much. They got peanuts. That you can close your eyes and anticipate panic 
in the United States of America and riots in the United States of America they might have to declare martial law in the United States but more than that that the collapse of the US dollar since this is the international currency and for that you'll have to study the Bretton Woods Accord which they don't teach in Al-Azhar University incidentally and they don't teach in the Darul Uloom so your Mufti I'm sorry does know the subject it's going to create panic in the weak currency areas of the world you know the world is divided into two kinds of haram paper money one is called the hard currency area and I was giving a talk in an international conference in Brunei in September and I made a joke and nobody laughed <laughs> and these were scholars from all over the world present there scholars of Islam I said that they have a special chemical and they dip their paper in the chemical and it comes out as hard currency <laughs> nobody laughed and I said we don't have the secret chemical <laughs> so when we dip our paper into the, 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 the solution it, it doesn't come out as hard currency <laughs> so, so their, their hard currency is in demand all over the world wish we could get that chemical eh? <laughs> and ours you take a whole basket full of Bangladeshi taka to Manhattan you can't even buy a cup of coffee and our galaxy of Islamic scholars sitting there nobody laughed <laughs> I think they were still the studying what chemical is he talking about <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad eh, when you make a joke and nobody laughs <laughs> so we're talking about the people who don't have the chemical the Indonesian rupiah the Bangladeshi taka the Pakistani rupee there's going to be panic as people struggle and rush to dump their paper because the price of bread is climbing every hour <laughs> runaway inflation mm -hmm. we are now on the brink of momentous and indeed monstrously evil change in the world as never before ever before experienced in human history and where are the scholars of Islam who are arguing with us what is his Akedah where did he get his Ijaza is he a Sufi and yet these are our brothers and they are our brothers and we do not speak disrespectfully of them who would declare for us don't listen to Imran Hussein who for 15 years now was able to see that this is coming they still can't see that it is coming they cannot understand the Arab Spring that it is preparatory to the Arab slaughter a number of things are taking place at the same time now and I want to introduce you to some of these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle so we can try to put them together I don't have to repeat what Dr. J Mira has so I don't know how he did it so brilliantly 
put all those pieces of the economic and monetary jigsaw puzzle together. But I have to expand on what he just gave to us. Additional to the economic and financial and monetary crisis of the moment, there's something else happening since 9-11. A proliferation of wars in different parts of the world, mostly the world of Islam. And if you notice something, in nearly in nearly all of these wars, or in fact in all of these wars, it is Uncle Sam. It is Uncle Sam who has to send his troops most of all. The American military is involved up to its throat. Yes, there is help from NATO, from the rest of NATO. And there is a pocket of presence, support from Japan and from Australia and from other places, but that's token support. But the brunt of the fighting is being done by the American military. I want to suggest to you that the economic and financial crash is coming at a time when an American military crash is also going to take place. It's not just the US dollar that's going to crumble. No. That the United States has been led by its nose to a trap where it will overextend itself. And the one that is leading the United States, I hope they're listening to me, in the American Armed Forces. The one who is leading the United States to a military trap are the Zionists who control the US Congress and the state of Israel. If you ran, there's a lecture I delivered maybe one week ago in uh, Tamantun, Dr. Ismail, which is on YouTube. Uh, implications of a Zionist Israeli attack on Iran in which I have explained the subject in much greater detail and we can mention here today that uh, as soon as Israel attacks Iran and I am anticipating that Israel would not want to deliver a knockout blow to Iran because Israel wants Iran to remain strong why? Because Israel knows that Iran is going to respond by attacking the American troops in Iraq, where is, Iran has the advantage of geographical position. And Iran has a second advantage of the majority of the population of, of Iraq will be supporting Iran, because they are Shia. And even the Sunni in Iraq would want to use this opportunity to deliver the death blow to the United States, in particular to NATO in Iraq. And so the implication of an Israeli attack on Iran is that the United States is going to be back to the wall in Iraq, fighting for survival. I have also suggested, and remember, I can make mistakes and I have made mistakes in the past. I am anticipating that Iran will also attack and take Bahrain, which should not be easy for them. It should not be difficult for them. And once Iran takes Bahrain, remember again the same situation, that in Bahrain the overwhelming majority would be in support of Iran and a small and strange minority of oppressors would be opposing Iran in Bahrain. So Iran will have the majority population of Bahrain on its side, because they're mostly Shia. Once Iran takes Bahrain, then Saudi Arabia, which is now after India, Israel's most strategic partner in the world, Saudi Arabia will now call on the United States. It's probably already prearranged. 
maybe they have a secret defense treaty and the United States Congress will ensure that the United States Army Armed Forces have to respond and send American troops into Saudi Arabia and guess what's going to happen the United States I am anticipating is going to face military defeat in Saudi Arabia and Iraq from Iran because the advantage is on the side of Iran and if the United States uses nuclear weapons that's it for Uncle Sam and so we see not only a financial crash taking place but also a military crash about to take place the wars that the United States have been waging particularly since 9-11 and the monstrous lies which they've had to, to tell about 9-11. You know, I have said that there are three kinds of lies. You heard it. There are ordinary lies. And then there are great lies. And then there's 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> the only people who are now holding on to 9-11 and the official the official explanation of 9-11 are your governments and your newspapers you know mainstream newspapers and television stands and so on, who know that they can't cannot cross the line they are slaves and servants of you know who so around the world the people are waking up and around the world is growing resentment against the United States to the extent that I have a student here in KL who is an American who was born in the United States who speaks with a, an American accent and is afraid to go to Pakistan why? Because if I go to Pakistan, although I look Pakistani, once I speak with an American accent, I'm going to be in danger. I'm going to be in danger. This growing resentment against the United States of America around the world was just demonstrated in a very dramatic way in South America. A few days ago, the heads of state of all the South American and Caribbean countries including my own Trinidad and Tobago met in a summit conference in Caracas to create a new organization that would replace the OAS or the Organization of American States the OAS or the American the Organization of American States includes Uncle Sam and includes Canada but guess what the new organization is called CIRAC Community of Caribbean and Latin American countries they held the inaugural conference in Caracas a few days ago and the United States and Canada are not invited to be part of this, con this organization. Hugo Chavez announced this is the end of the Monroe Doctrine. I'm not going to tell you what is the Monroe Doctrine. Take a note of it and when you go home, check it out on Google. What is the Monroe Doctrine? Here is startling evidence the creation of this rival organization called SILAC to replace the organization of American states in such a strategically important part of the world evidence of the declining status of the United States of America in the world growing hatred growing resentment is also leading to isolation there's more hatred coming let me explain 
so we can see the pieces coming together. What's going to happen when Iran is attacked? Naturally, the price of oil is going to shoot up dramatically. Apart from the fact that the US dollar will be collapsing. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, it's a hadith of Sahih Bukhari. It is also in Sahih Muslim. He said about Akhiru Zaman, one of the signs of the last day, is that the river Euphrates, you have studied geography, haven't you? The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. But he went on to say that the believers must not touch it. We can understand if the, bo if the gold came from the bank and it's riba, you don't touch that. But this is not coming from a bank. This is not the bank of Euphrates, this is the river. So this can't be haram gold. No, the halal gold. Well then why did he say that the believers must not touch that gold? Hmm? He said that mankind will fight over that gold. And that 99 over, out of every 100 will be killed. Which means that it's not going to be conventional warfare. Because conventional warfare don't kill. 99 out of every 100 combatants. This is going to be nuclear warfare, really, or some kind of a warfare similar to nuclear warfare, which would kill 99 out of every 100, or biological warfare. So this is not going to be Tom, Dick and Harry fighting with little pistols. It has to be global, global warfare over that gold. If you are persuaded that the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam is talking about a mountain of that metal gold, that is your right. And nobody is going to look down upon you. But there is going to be a mountain of gold. A mountain is something very high. And it's going to come from the river Euphrates. Or maybe you might want to say, well, the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam is using symbolic language when he used the word mountain. And then what he meant was a large amount of gold, because gold is normally underground, eh? under the river. So a large amount of gold is going to come from underneath the river. Maybe you want to use that kind of interpretation of the word mountain. But there are some who say, no, mountain is mountain. And you have no right to interpret the word mountain to mean large quantity. Or you may want to allow me to offer an opinion and of course you know the warning whenever Imran Hussein gives an opinion please do not accept it until you are convinced that it is correct I can't do more than that can I I want to suggest to you that not only is the word mountain being used symbolically but also that the word gold is also being used symbolically. And that what the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is speaking of is black gold or oil. Yes, I know. They're going to jump on my neck now. But never mind. It's a different methodology at work here. From the one which reduces religion to text and insist that the text must always be interpreted literally, the Protestant version of Islam. Whereas I am offering a different methodology 
where I'm using, if you'll excuse me, spiritual insight to try to put the pieces together to make a meaningful whole. That the black oil, the black gold or oil, as soon as it was discovered anywhere in the world, the Zionists immediately made sure they took control of it. Everywhere in the world that oil was discovered, the Zionists ensured they took control of it. And they even had control of Venezuela's oil until Hugo Chavez came along. They even had control of Iran's oil. And they engineered a coup d'etat to overthrow Mohammed Mossadegh so that they could recover control over that oil until the Ira Iranian revolution came along and they lost control of that oil. Why did they want to take control of oil, the Zionists? Because oil became the machinery of a new world economy, an industrial economy. It made the factories work. It gave us transportation. You are now hooked onto oil for transportation. You are now hooked onto oil and to fertilizers for agriculture. You are hooked onto oil for industrial manufacturing. You can't do without oil. And the day that you don't have oil, you're going to have riots. So guess what's going to happen now? When Israel attacks Iran. That's why he said, the believers should not touch it. Meaning, do not allow yourself to become dependent on that oil. Because it's a trap. I remember an engineer in Lahore in Pakistan. He's passed away now, may Allah have his mercy on his soul. Who established, established an engineering company in Lahore. British trade engineer. And he said to me, all that we wanted to do was to explore the use of solar energy for running fans, for fans to operate. Pakistan is a hot country. And if we could succeed in using solar energy for fans, we would cut the import bill on oil for Pakistan. So every home has fans. And he says, as soon as my company went to work on this project, the World Bank and the IMF sprang into action and came down on the government of Pakistan to force our company to abandon this project. Meaning, they did not want us to escape from the trap of dependence on oil. And so now the trap is about to be sprung. Escalating prices of oil as soon as Iran is attacked. And Iran is a major producer of oil, but in addition to that, Iran sits in control of the Straits of Hormuz. The Gulf, Persian Gulf, all the tank, oil tankers have to pass there. Straits of Hormuz is very narrow. On one side is Iran, on the other side is Oman. And Iran can close the Straits of Hormuz. And so we'll have a dramatic and monumental increase in the price of oil. And that's going to break the back of many people around the world. Because the price of oil increasing means the price of food increasing. Do you understand? Are you seeing the picture? The price of food increasing, the price of transport increasing, hmm? the price of manufactured goods increasing, cost of living rising and rising and rising. And when people cannot afford because of the increasing price, they're going to blame Uncle Sam because he's the one who's been waging all these wars for the last 10 years. 
and Israel will take a little bit of the flack, but they, the media will ensure that the major blame goes on the United States. Uh, so I am suggesting to you that when the Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the believers should not touch that gold. It doesn't make sense that he's talking about the metal. Why, why should we not touch the metal, which is halal? I'm suggesting to you, and you do not have to accept my opinion, once again, that this is a different methodology at work from that one or the Protestant Islam, in which we interpret, we interpret the text as religious symbolism, and we say it's black gold. Why are these pieces coming together at this time? And we can go on to many other things. We want to suggest to you that, that which puts all the pieces of the jigsaw together to give you the big picture, the Islamic eschatology, is saying to us that the time has come for the United States of America to be replaced as the ruling state in the world. And for those young students who we have here today, and there's so many of them, let us explain what is a ruling state. To rule the world as a ruling state does, does not mean that you have to rule every square inch of downtown Chicago. And Jakarta. No. A ruling state, when we use the term, is a state whose power and dominance in the world cannot be challenged by any rival or combination of rivals. In this sense of the word, the holy state of Israel, established by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the prophet David, and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, the prophet Solomon, was the ruling state in the world. And Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam made the dua which is in the Quran that Allah may grant that no state in history could ever rival this state, the holy state of Israel. And so came the status of a ruling state. In our book, Jerusalem in the Quran, I forgot it over there, it's at the back. Jerusalem in the Quran, we explain the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam about three ruling states. Three ruling states created by Dajjal in his three stages of his mission. Before Dajjal will emerge in this world of space and time as a human being. He would be a Jew. He would be a young man. He would be powerfully built. He would have curly hair. And from Jerusalem, he's going to declare, I am the Messiah. And all the Zionists, the Christian Zionists and the Jewish Zionists and their followers, would say, yes, he is the Messiah. But you and I know that would be a lie. He is someone who has been created and programmed to impersonate the Messiah. And you and I know that the Messiah is the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the prophet Jesus. He would be Dajjal, the false messiah. And the time has now arrived in the process of history where after having created Britain as the first ruling state with something that they call Pax Britannica and then having caused or engineered the collapse of Britain and its replacement with the United States of America as a second ruling state of the world with something that they call Pax Americana we have now reached that moment in time using our methodology which they reject Protestant Islam 
rejects our methodology and Protestant Islam says don't listen to Imran Hussein don't listen to him he has no Akida he's a Sufi well go ahead go ahead but you're still my brothers and I don't speak disrespectfully of you but this methodology is delivering the goods this methodology is explaining the world today and I won't end without explaining the methodology that we are now located at that moment in time and I'm addressing you now Protestant Islam when the Jal's day like a month is ending and his day like a week is beginning and a new ruling state is emerging which will replace the United States of America that is the big picture the jigsaw puzzle has now been put together Israel wants to replace the United States of America as the third and last ruling state in the world you have never said that Protestant Islam we are saying it and guess what the Muslims around the world are convinced that we are correct and we thank Allah who gave us the insight to be able to see the big picture through Islamic eschatology when Israel takes over from the United States and the financial crash and the economic crash and the military crash and the hatred for the United States around the world and so on are all part of the agenda to bring down the United States when Israel takes over from the United States and the world then Israel must establish its political and economic dominion over the whole world and the first people they have to, to rule will the Arabs of course otherwise no Jew will accept this as a ruling state and so the Arab Spring has come at this time to facilitate the wars that Israel will have to wage in order to subdue the Arab world and establish an Israeli political and economic dominion over the Arab world and yet Arab Islamic scholarship knows nothing about this Arab Islamic scholarship knows absolutely nothing about it that is our predicament today that we need a new generation of scholars of Islam using the methodology that we are offering to be able to read the world correctly it is at this time that we have to ask why is it that Protestant Islam has emerged at this time with an insistence that religion is based on texts that your hands have to be here and not here and that your feet have to be like this and not like this and that your pants or your pajama must reach here and not there I'm still using respectful language you should have heard my teacher Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah he thundered at them 40 years ago he gave them he blasted them left right and center but Imran doesn't have his thunder my teacher of blessed memory Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah this Salafi version of the faith and remember Salafis you are my brothers and I am not picking up boxing gloves against you this is an academic an intellectual discourse we differ why can't we differ why can't we exchange views without hatred for each other why you are my brothers but that does not mean that you are immune for my offering a valid criticism of a methodology which is incapable of recognizing why the financial crash is taking place now why the economic crash is taking place now whereas our methodology is explaining why it is taking place now and there's something else which is happening at this time the pieces are coming together we have a group called the Tablig Jamaat who have fanned out around the world 
And they are beautiful brothers. Oh yes. When you see the way they live, you see how they are regular in their salat, they dress in a particular way, they are conforming with the sunnah, you say, Masha Allah. Masha Allah. I don't think we can fit Tabliq Jamaat in the Blue Jeans Jamaat, can we? You know the Blue Jeans Jamaat. <laughs> but why is it that at this particular time, when we face it, a challenge different from any that we have ever faced before, that we should now have this Protestant version of Islam with that epistemology and with this gathering of large numbers of people, 500,000 ijtima in downtown Chicago. Dajjal is not bothered at all about that. Why? They show no concern whatsoever. They show, Tablik Jamaat shows absolutely no concern whatsoever with Islamic eschatology that would explain the reality of the world today and which would anticipate the events which are unfolding today and tomorrow. I say that this is not happening by accident and it is time for us to deliver a wake-up call lovingly of course, not with boxing gloves to all those who are members of the Tablik Jamaat, the only Jamaat in the world incidentally which has closed the doors of the masjid to me wherever in the world I have gone. I cannot go into a masjid controlled by Tablik Jamaat to teach them that which they do not know. And they don't have the teachers to teach it. Most of the Salafi masjids are the same except for, may Allah bless him, Sheikh Faiz in Sydney. Sheikh Faiz, who is the former Salafi Sheikh of, of Australia, graduate of the Islamic University of Medina. And when I was in Australia for my second visit in 2002, Sheikh Faiz came to my home where I was staying and brought a Lebanese breakfast one morning so we could sit down and have Lebanese breakfast and then invited me to his center to give a lecture on Islam and the international monetary system. And before the lecture could take place, he asked me to come into his office. And he said to me, Sheikh Imran, I want to become your student. Those were the words he spoke to me. Well, he's such a learned man, I should be his student. Why is it? Why can't we give you a wake-up call and yet remain brothers with each other? Because your methodology is wrong. You're putting your head in the sand like an ostrich in Tablik Jamaat and not paying attention to understanding events unfolding in the world is dangerous for the Ummah. It's like sleepwalking through history. I thought Ronald Reagan was the only one who did it. <laughs> but that's what you're doing Tablik Jamaat. Do not be annoyed with me. Do not be offended. Because you're my brothers. Now let's come to the methodology. The Prophet said that every Prophet warned about the Jal. And the Prophet Nuh warned about the Jal. But I'm going to tell you something that no one has ever said before me. The Jal sees with the left eye, he's blind in the right eye, it looks like a bulging grip. The Jal sees with the left eye, he's blind in the right eye, it looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one-eyed. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir, kafir, kafir. And every mu'min will be able to read it, whether that mu'min is literate or illiterate. And so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu will be able to read it. Kafir. But Tony Blair won't be able to read it. You know he was just convicted for war crimes right here in KL. So we sent Tony Blair to the eye specialist. Check out his eyes. Why he cannot read this kafir? 
Oh, when you're sending Tony Blair, send George Bush also with him. <laughs> and then the report comes, nothing wrong with their eyes. Well then how come they can't read, but the mu'min can read? We say, and this is our viewpoint, and you don't have to accept it. Is that when the child sees with the left eye, this is religious symbolism at work, that he is seeing with external sight. And when he is blind in the right eye, this is religious symbolism at work. And he's internally blind. And that's why the kafir cannot read. Because when the mu'min reads, he's not reading with these eyes alone. He's, returning, he's reading with internal sight. And did the Prophet not say, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, I wish I had another one hour to deal with the subject. He said, Ittaku firasat al-mu'min. فَإِنَّهُ يَنْزُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Fear, the firasa, the firasa is that hikmah or that wisdom of the believer which is intuitive in nature and founded on spirituality. Fear, the intuitive internal spiritual insight or wisdom of the mu'min because when he sees he sees with the nur of Allah and so this hadith is speaking about epistemology and about spirituality the absolute imperative of pursuing the spiritual quest so that you'll have internal nur with which to see and so that you have a chance of walking in the path of Khidr alayhi salam. After all, it is Surah Al-Kaf of the Qur'an, which is the Surah of Ilmu Akhir zaman Paraksilas. And Khidr alayhi salam is different from the rest because you'll only meet him where? You'll meet him at Majma'ul Bahrain. Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. Which two oceans go to Imam al-Baydawi and his tafsir? The ocean of knowledge externally acquired. The ocean of knowledge internally received. When these two oceans of knowledge come together, as they did in my teacher of blessed memory, Mawlana Dr. Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, when these two oceans come together in an individual, in a scholar, and are harmoniously integrated, only then do you have the scholar who can take all the pieces together and solve the jigsaw puzzle and deliver to you the big picture. And so today we address them, Protestant Islam, and we ask you to take another look at epistemology and at spirituality, the methodology that we are offering. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tawa alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahmin. Ameen. There are those who believe that uh, And they are correct, of course, that money in Islam is dinar and dirham. And there are lots of dirhams at the back there, you can take a look at them. Money in Islam is dinar and dirham. Malaysia is minting dinar and dirham now. However, dinar and dirham are still prohibited in this country as legal tender. I understand that Bank Negara is tolerating it because they are interpreting it as bata. Bata. So dinar and dirham is not money, it's a commodity being bartered. <laughs> there are those who are persuaded, and I don't want to call names, that it is possible for us to overturn 
the current monetary system of paper money, which is on its way out, and electronic money, which is already here, that we can overturn it and replace it with dinar and dirham at the macro level. I don't think it's possible. But if you think it's possible, go ahead. No, because of my eschatology, I studied Gog and Magog. And there's a book on Gog and Magog at the back. When you study the subject of Gog and Magog, you'll understand that you cannot do it. They're too powerful. So I have offered an alternative. I said, if you can't do it at the macro level, then do it at the micro. At the micro level, those of us who want, not everybody want to get away from the ringgit. Those of us who want to return to dinar and dirham and get away from the riba, this small group, we will head withdraw from the cities. And we will head for something called, you're familiar with the word, aren't you? Kampung. And we will build small communities, Muslim communities. And in our small communities, we'll have small micro markets. And in our micro markets, we will not allow the use of the haram paper money and electronic money. In our micro markets, we're going to use dinar and dirham. And when dinar and dirham are in short supply, will the police come and seize all our dinar and dirham? Then we will turn to wheat and barley and dates and salt and rice and sugar and what? They can't ban that, can they? So this is my solution. And right here in this hall, I have students. Right here in this hall now, I have students who are working actively to do precisely that right here in Malaysia. It is my opinion that the Arabs are being set up to be slaughtered. Israel has already decided that Israel has to wage big wars to subdue the Arabs. And these wars may include biological warfare. Because the Prophet ﷺ prophesied that the Arabs are going to be wiped out by plague. Swine flu. Swine flu. Taste of things to come. But Israel does not want to wage her big wars and appear naked before the world as an aggressor. Because they want Pax Judaica to look good. And so you bring an Arab Spring, but you can only bring that Arab Spring after you have tortured the Arabs for 40 years, humiliated them, barbaric oppression for 40 years. Only then can you bring an Arab Spring. When the Arab Spring comes, it offers you freedom. That's what they did with the Soviet Union and communism. In order for the United States and Western Europe to look good, they had to engineer a Bolshevik revolution that brought into being communism. And they had to then demonize communism as a prison where people had no freedom. They had to do that to offer a, a contrast. Uh, we are the free world. What nonsense. <laughs> we have the free market. What rubbish. Which free market? But we swallowed the garbage, didn't we? This is the free world. And this is free trade. And this is the free market and all that rubbish and garbage. Why? Because they created communism. To use that as the bogeyman. And after they had finished that job, then they demolished communism. We don't need it anymore. Similarly, they did that with the Arabs for 40 years. So that they could 
come with the Arab Spring. You could not have an Arab Spring with all those 40 years of torture and oppression. If you had a, you had a beard and you landed in Egypt as an Egyptian, you'd, you're in trouble. Tunisians couldn't go to the masjid. Huh? Women couldn't be in hijab. A president in Tunisia said, Ramadan is not conducive to economic growth. Huh? <laughs> and then another one wanted to take Ramadan out of the summer. Or put Ramadan at a time when everybody would be relaxing and so on. Change it from Ramadan, the fast. The Arab Spring is meant to bring about elections, democracy, so-called freedom. And in these elections, you could close your eyes if you understand Islamic eschatology. The Islamic parties have to win. They have to have landslides. How did I know this? I said it months ago. I don't have an angel whispering into my ear. I don't have a jinn. All the jinn are in Washington. <laughs> I'm not a prophet. How did I know that the Islamic parties are going to win the elections, in the Arab elections? It's because of Islamic eschatology, you dum dum. Why don't you study it? But you cannot study Islamic eschatology unless you use this methodology. Majma'ul Bahrain. When the Islamic parties win the elections and form government, number one, you have to bring Sharia. Number two, you have to support the Palestinians. And on both fronts, they have time bombs waiting to explode. And then the Islamic, Islamic parties and governments are going to be declared terrorists. Huh? And then Israel will be able to wage her wars while claiming to the world, we are only defending ourselves from terrorists. Are we saving mankind? from the menace of Islam. That's why. What can you do? You can start in the Arab world by creating a new generation of scholars of Islam who have the capacity to study and deliver Islamic eschatology that you'll understand the reality that you're facing in the world today. Unless you understand that reality, you cannot respond to it. Yes, I believe that there are going to be more of these monstrous acts of terrorism that the Israeli Mossad will engineer and the CIA and then they put the blame on us. Yes, I believe it's going to be coming. In addition to the very valid point made about mon monetary matters, Islamic banking is also fraudulent on another front. Nabi Muhammad would sometime buy goods and he would not have the money to pay for it. So the shopkeeper would give him time to pay. When you buy and you're given time to pay, this is called a credit transaction. Credit transaction. So a credit transaction is halal in Islam. But there is no evidence that the shopkeeper was allowed to raise his price because he had to wait for his money. And so credit price and cash price had to be the same. If credit price is higher than cash price, higher purchase or morabaha. If credit price is higher than cash price, the difference between the two would be because of time. That money can increase over time. If you believe that money can increase over time, you are misguided, dangerously misguided. Because Allah says, no, money cannot increase over time. That transaction is invalid. That is riba. But the Islamic banks now they are beginning to understand that the tide is turning against them. So now they're back to the wall. But their so-called murabaha is not halal at all. It's actually riba through the back door. 
what is Protestant Islam? Let me re re repeat. A religion, a conception of religion, which came in the European world, which gave to itself the name Protestantism, when it broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, and which insisted that religion was based on texts, T-E-X-T-S. And that the text must be understood literally. This methodology of Protestant Islam, this methodology came to the Muslim world. It started with Muhammad Abdul Wahhab in Saudi Arabia with a movement, I didn't coin the term, so don't take a boxing gloves for me. <laughs> the world of Islam chose to call it the Wahhabi movement, so do not fight me over it. Yeah. For how so long? We, the, the whole world of Islam has been calling it the Wahhabi movement, now you want to fight me over the word? This movement now calls itself Salafi. And I am saying to them, and they are my brothers, and I am not fighting them. I am saying to them that you have the Protestant version of Islam. And in this Protestant version of Islam, where you confine yourself to the study of text, this is your primary concern. Not the Noor, but the text. And that you interpret the text literally. This you cannot understand Islamic eschatology. You will not be able to understand the world today. You will not be able to do what I just did. To say that the economic crash and the final financial crash subserve another greater whole. And that is Israel's ambition to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. Do the Salafis have this understanding? I gave a lecture at uh, Cyber Jaya a couple of months ago, I think during Ramadan. The Muslim youth in a glamorous world. <laughs> the lecture is on YouTube. Listen to it. But one part of the lecture comes out of Surah Al Kaf of the Quran. Don't tell me Kafi, eh? it's Surah Al Kaf. In Surah Al Kaf of the Quran, those who had the courage to stand up and proclaim the truth. Those who had the backbone, you know, some people have backbone made out of iron and steel, and others have backbone made out of recycled paper, you know that. Those who had the backbone to be able to stand up and proclaim the truth in the faces of the world's greatest tyrants and bandits were prepared for that sacrifice of giving up everything, giving up your job, giving up your home, giving up your town, and withdrawing. They fled to the cave, and we are fleeing to Kampung. <laughs> but there were youth, innahum fityatun amanu Birabbihim wazidnahum huda. So the nicest message of all today is the message for the youth. That you are the ones, not the elders, you are the ones who are going to take the flag of Islam. And you are the ones who are going to take the flag of Islam to victory tomorrow. So you have to study the Quran. And in particular, you have to study Surah al Kaf. And I have at the back three books of Surah al Kaf. It's a quartet. The first one is Surah al Kaf, the tafsir, the explanation. That's at the back. The second one is Surah al Kaf in the modern age, which is the ta'wil, the interpretation. That's at the back. The third one is Gog and Magog. An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. That comes out of Surah al Kaf. Eh? And if you send me less emails, I'll be able to write the fourth one. 
an Islamic view of Dajjal, the false messiah. This is my interpretation and I can be wrong. I said that when Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam saw in a vision that he must sacrifice his son or he is sacrificing his son, Nabi Ismail alayhi salam. And then he went to him and he said to him, Ya Bunayya inni ara fil manami anni azbahu. Fanzul maza tara. The son then replied, Ya batifal ma tu umar. Oh my son, this is what I've seen in my sleep. How do you respond? And the son replied and said, Oh father, do as you have been commanded. So the son and the father understood it to be a divine command. And when he was about to sacrifice his son, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called out to him by name, Ya Ibrahim, by name. Qad sadaqta ru'ya, you have already fulfilled the vision. The vision never required of you to actually take a knife and cut your son's throat. Without doing that, without taking a knife and cutting your son's throat, you have already fulfilled the vision. Indicating that what Allah wanted of him was acceptance of the slaughter. Acceptance of the slaughter. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam the best of those who came from Nabi Ismail Alayhi Salam are the Kinana and the best of the Kinana are the Quraysh and the best of the Quraysh are Banu Hashim and I am the best of Banu Hashim indicating a straight line from Nabi, Ibrahim, Nabi Ismail alayhi salam to the Arabs. And so I have suggested and I can be wrong. I have suggested that what this vision it was intended to convey was that there is a slaughter of Ismail alayhi salam which is to come at the end of history. And the slaughter of Ismail alayhi salam is the slaughter of the Arabs. And Allah wanted this acceptance from Ibrahim alayhi salam because this was required as part of the divine plan for the Jews to be punished with the greatest punishment that has ever been punished upon anyone. And so when the Arab slaughter takes place tomorrow, those innocent Arabs are not those who are worshipping Washington, they have the Qibla in Washington. Those innocent Arabs who now face death would know we are dying because Allah wanted this in order for His plan to ultimately be concluded with the Jews running behind, not all Jews, the oppressor running behind trees and stones and then the trees and the stones speaking and saying Ya Muslim There's a Jew hiding behind me so come and kill him indicating that universal hatred for the Zionists will reach fever pitch in the world and the strike on Iran is putting the last nail in your coffin.
firdausi ala wa la aqwa ala naril jahim Allah faham beli taubat tawafir dhunubi fa innaka ghafiru dhambi al-azim Tuhan ku aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku. Sesungguhnya engkaulah pengampun dosa-dosa besar. Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu, tetapi aku. Tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa nerakamu Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkaulah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Allah fahab li ta'ala